Sean, Lynn, Josie and Megan were a typical British family living in Chillenden, Kent. Having moved to Kent from Wales in early 1996, the family were enjoying the peaceful tranquility that accompanies a life in the Kentish country. Sean had found work in Canterbury and Lynn was the homemaker, whilst Josie and Megan were described as bubbly children. The Russell family were going through a standard morning, nothing out of the ordinary. Everyone was eating breakfast and discussing plans for the day, unaware of how July 9th was destined to play out. A little after 8am, Sean said goodbye to Lynn and drove his children to Goodenstone Primary School. The school sits in the peaceful village of Goodenstone in Kent and it's a relatively short walk from Chillenden. As the day progresses, lessons and tasks are being completed, but elsewhere, a disturbed man has other tasks to complete. Michael Stone was a heroin user who had a violent criminal history. As a youngster, Stone was placed into a children's home in the village of Eastry, not far from Chillenden. He had a rough upbringing, mainly growing up in abusive environments where children are often mistreated and neglected by staff. It is unclear if he suffered physical or sexual abuse as a juvenile, but whatever he experienced, it couldn't have been great. A look into his past reveals a history of mental health issues and a disturbing violent criminal history, including an incident where he attacked somebody with a knife. Stone tied up his girlfriend and frequently sold stolen property, including gardening tools. It should be noted that Stone was operating with the intent of robbing people to pay for gear. The school day was coming to a close and Lynn Russell was in charge of meeting her daughters in Goodenstone. Since the school is only a mile and a half from Chillenden and it's a nice day, she decides to walk. Also, the family dog named Lucy will benefit from the walk. Lynn makes it to the primary school and the three Russell family members begin walking back home. As they walk, a family friend and her young daughter are getting ready to drive home. They beat their horn to signal to the Russell family that they can give them a lift home. However, the Russell family don't hear the signal and quickly disappear out of sight. Sean received a call from a family friend, the same woman who beeped at Lynn, Megan, and Josie. She was supposed to take the girls to Brownies at 5 p.m. Despite knocking on the front door of Granary Cottage, there was no response. The family friend felt it was strange but shrugged it off and drove her own daughter to Brownies. Hours passed and Sean was becoming more frantic and concerned by the minute. He called the police before actively searching the local area of Chillenden, driving around. It stays light out in the summer, but the darkness was slowly beginning to creep in. When his search led nowhere and it became too dark, Sean tried calling other people, including the local veterinarian. Sean considered the possibility that Lucy, the family dog, may have been injured during the day. The calls went nowhere and once everything else failed, Sean phoned police for the second time. Thankfully, local police had taken the earlier call seriously and rounded up a search party. They arrived at Granary Cottage to talk to Sean. Sean was asked to provide some basic descriptions of Lynn, Megan, and Josie. The girls would have been wearing school uniforms and likely had towels because they'd attended a swimming gala. Lynn spent the day at the house. Therefore, she could have easily changed clothing since the last time that Sean saw her, at 8 that morning. Sean would also be asked about his relationship for any clues to determine if there had been any recent arguments, or built up friction within the family anything that may explain the sudden disappearance of his wife and kids. In a shocking turn of events, a policeman entered Granary Cottage and informed Sean that his family had been found deceased. Sean expected the worst having noticed the officer's body language. At first, Sean wasn't sure if they had been killed in a road accident or another type of unfortunate accidental encounter. Police kept the graphic details quiet and told Sean that everything was being considered suspicious. Statistically speaking, most people are murdered by people that they know. However, Sean wasn't considered a suspect. He was visibly shocked and his entire life had just been destroyed. Sean made suicidal remarks in the police car but helped police to create a timeline of events that may help to solve the case. The very next day and Sean must have undergone unimaginable suffering. I doubt that he could find any comfort in sleeping because he still didn't have many answers, only questions. He was still at the police station when police informed him that Josie, his eldest daughter, was still alive. Josie had already been transferred to a London hospital. Sean was both thrilled but also devastated because of the tragedy. Details and news of the brutal double murder spread nationwide and everyone was horrified that such a crime would occur in a peaceful place. Lynn, Megan and Josie had been found along Cherry Garden Lane, close to Goodstone in Kent. Lynn and Megan had been beaten to death with a hammer. Police combed the countryside for clues but quickly came up with little evidence. The crime scene was outside and recovering DNA was next to impossible. Not only was recovering DNA a daunting task, but in 1996, CCTV wasn't readily available in such a small community. There wasn't any motive to this crime because it was senseless and unprovoked. 
the victims would have been defenseless to their attacker and the killer had even killed the family dog. The first step for police was to search for potential eyewitnesses to the crime. Eyewitnesses would help police form an e-fit image of the offender. People driving in the area had noticed a beige car parked up and many instantly went to the assumption that this was the offender's car. These tips sounded good but eyewitness accounts aren't entirely beneficial in cases like this and many accounts are proven to be unreliable. Perhaps it was a miracle or some other divine intervention because Josie Russell somehow managed to recover from her head injuries. Josie would have temporary problems because of brain surgery. This would involve Josie's speech and language but she had made it through a terrible ordeal and could help the investigation tremendously. It only took Josie six weeks before she could leave hospital. This is incredibly rare and astounding given the situation. As mentioned, the family had originally moved from Wales. The devastating events had completely ruined the peaceful life in Kent. Therefore, Sean and Josie returned to Wales. At some point, Josie managed to give her account of July 9th. She told police that along the country lane, a man exited his red car and demanded money. Given the location, it is strange for someone to attempt a robbery and even think that someone would be carrying sufficient amounts of cash. Josie said that Lynn told the man that they could return home to collect some but he didn't accept and tied up the Russell family. Josie remembered being blindfolded but she was soon hit into unconsciousness. Lynn and Megan succumbed to their head trauma. By now, the case had been cold for a year. It would be in July 1997 that a man would be arrested and charged with the Russell murders. Michael Stone was reported to police as being the potential murderer. It would emerge that Michael Stone had been in Medway on the day of the crime but could have realistically travelled down to Chillenden. According to friends, he knew the surrounding areas of Eastry because he had partly grown up there. By all accounts, Stone was a fantasist and he wasn't a good man. He had likely murdered at least one man in Maidstone during one of his many robberies in the 1970s. Despite him having been arrested for a double murder, the case against Michael Stone wasn't exactly compelling and relied on the word of another prisoner. A year after his arrest and Michael Stone would be found guilty of the Russell murders with flimsy evidence. Authorities had no forensic or DNA evidence. A bootlace found at the scene was tied to stone, merely on the fact that it had been presumed that he had used it to aid in him injecting substances. In order to get a conviction in court, evidence relied solely on testimony from someone placed into a cell next to stone. According to this man, he had apparently confessed to the Russell murders from this separate cell. Even to an outsider looking in, you can already see the flaws with this being the main piece of evidence in the case. Stone protested his innocence and continues to do so till this day. Strangely, nobody could prove that Stone was present at the crime scene and even worse still, there's no forensic evidence even tying him to the crime. It makes you question if Michael Stone is even responsible for the murders and why he would even drive from Medway, which is roughly 30 miles from the closest city of Canterbury, to an isolated, village community. Was he going back to communities neighbouring Eastry to rob people or is all of this just an unlucky coincidence? Whatever the answer, Kent police needed to put someone away for the crime. The lack of any solid evidence against him probably wouldn't help to convict someone for such a crime in the present day. Stone himself put forth infamous serial killer Levi Belfield as being a concrete suspect in this case. His modus operandi fits this crime because Levi killed both women and children. He used blunt force to kill his victims and many point to him as being the perpetrator of the crime. However, his ex-partner told police that Levi had been with her on that same day in 1996. It was her daughter's birthday and Levi had been with her all day. According to his ex-partner, there wasn't a moment in which Belfield could have left the area to commit a crime so far away and return without suspicion. Personally, I feel as though Levi fits the profile more than Stone but Levi's ex feels confident about this being accurate. The Russell murders left a community and its surrounding area residents feeling traumatized and deeply hurt. The offender destroyed a kind-hearted family and fractured the myth of safety in a rural Kentish village. Regardless of who is punished for the crime, Sean and Josie will forever be without Lynn and Megan. Chillenden will always be associated with the year 1996 and the brutal murders of their loved ones.